bring on the night shift. Ain't nothing quite like working until after dark, when all the creepy crawlies and ghoulies emerge from the woodwork, looking for someone to chew on. Enjoy these eight extremely disturbing night shift stories, but remember to lock your doors, or else you might not be alone for long. Remember, if you have a story to share, go to darkstories.org. I'd love to hear some sleepover stories and security guard encounters. Oh, and tell me in the comments if you've ever had a night shift job, and if so, what's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you during your shift? Now, let's begin. Night Stalker at Work From Leia I'm a 21-year-old girl. My story is of a stalker who continued to come to my work late at night. I worked part-time at a clothing store, which I will not say the specific name of. I had been working at my work for almost a full month and was still getting the hang of everything. I was put on the 7pm to 12am shift, so that meant I would close the store. The store was really good about always having two or more people close the store so that he wouldn't be alone. Thank God for that, because it was just us girls working there. The only man was my manager who was rarely in. So on my shift was one of my closest friends named Shannon, as well as a girl who was also new like me named Katie, and the assistant manager, Hannah. Shannon was vacuuming in the different clothing departments. Hannah was in the back dealing with shipments, and Katie was cleaning out the dressing rooms and putting away clothes. Now, please note that there always has to be someone up front where the cash registers are. And unfortunately, that person was me. I was fine with being up there by myself. I didn't mind it. I liked the peace and quiet, since we didn't have many customers late at night. I'm a very anxious person, so I usually try not to make eye contact with people and smile awkwardly. Hannah had brought up some new clothes from the back that needed to be tagged and put away. Then she returned to the back. I began tagging up front as a man walked in. He was wearing a light gray t-shirt with dark jeans, flip-flops, and a baseball cap. I didn't pay much attention as I really love tagging clothes, so I said my usual, welcome to the store, and went back to tagging. I guess he took that as an invitation to come and talk to me. He came up to the counter and leaned on the glass showcases. I asked him if there was anything I could help with. He then requested to know where the men's beanies were, which we don't sell. I told him that. He nodded and grew silent, staring at me as I tagged clothes. I got a bit uncomfortable but kept tagging, hoping he would go away. A few minutes passed as he randomly said my name. Just the sound of my name coming from his mouth gave me the creeps. I looked over at him with a nervous smile and said, Yes, what can I help you with? Keep in mind that at this point, he had been in our store for nearly an hour. He asked me how hard my job was and how many off days I get. I told him it's not too hard and I'm not off a lot because of the lack of workers. We only had five other girls. He asked me if I wanted to leave work and, quote unquote, do a little something something together. That creeped me out to the point I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. I told him politely that I have a boyfriend, which was true. He then got enraged and began yelling at me. Really, that's how you're gonna be. The other girls heard the commotion and came up front to my aid as the man stormed outside, but not before he showed me his knife in his pocket secretively. I could feel tears forming in my eyes as Shannon grabbed me by my hands, concerned. Hannah was asking me what happened, but I couldn't get my words out. All I could do was start to hyperventilate and cry. Shannon took me to the back and held me as I cried. Hannah came back and told me that I could leave early. It was 11.30 at that point. I told her okay and thank you as I grabbed my purse from my locker and I said my goodbyes. 
I walked cautiously to my car outside, and I saw the same man from earlier sitting on the hood of my car, twirling the blade in his hands while watching me. My knees felt like noodles as I ran back inside. I then screamed at Hannah to lock the doors. She questioned me why, and I told her to look on my car. She saw him and mumbled a curse under her breath. She then locked the doors and set the alarms and proceeded to call the police. The police showed up, but said all they found on my car were stab marks and the brake line had been cut. I don't work at that store anymore, so to my stalker, let's not meet again. Not Alone from L. Charade. I'm a 34-year-old woman who's been working at the library for several years now. Our town's library is quite nice. Half of it is all glass. The other half is this relaxing wood color. Speaking of relaxing, working at a library is the most comfortable job I've ever had. We're open from 8 to 8. And after 8 p.m., I organize books until 10, then take off for home. And usually, only one person needs to stick around until 10. And as I'm single and kind of bored at home, I like to volunteer to be the one that sticks around organizing books after closing, much to the joy of my coworkers. One particularly slow Thursday, 8 o'clock rolls around. I bid goodbye to my coworkers as I begin to organize books, taking my time and listening to some Avril Lavigne. Now, organizing books isn't a hard job. We have a slot at the side of the building that collects books for those who don't want to enter, but need to return something. So I just grab the tub that has all the books in them that have been returned, go through them, put them where they need to go, and double check the digital catalog to make sure that they're all checked in on there too. Usually, it's as easy as just scanning the book back in, but our scanner had been broken for the last month. Funny how a library with such a nice exterior has a broken scanner that the city just doesn't want to replace too quickly. I didn't mind. If I had to stay past 10 a few minutes, so be it. I would get that organization done. While I'm looking through the bin that I had just dragged to the front desk, I hear the front doors open and close, which reminds me that like an idiot, I'd forgotten to lock the doors up front. I can be a forgetful person. Usually when I forget to lock the doors and someone comes in, it's as easy as saying, I'm sorry, but we're closed. Most people are fine with that and don't start a problem. But I swear when I looked up at the front doors, I didn't see anyone there. It was as if the door opened on its own. Or if someone did come in, they raced past before I could look up which would be a really weird thing to do. So I just assumed that someone had opened the door before they saw the hours printed on the door. Then they realized we were closed. I shrugged and kept doing my job. But I did keep an ear and eye out in case someone did sneak in. That's not unheard of either. I've had the local junior high and high school kids try to sneak in and stay overnight. I had no idea why they kept doing this until I saw the same thing being done on YouTube. Grown men sneaking behind Walmart shelves and staying the night unbeknownst to the employees. While that can be funny and entertaining to watch, Walmart is different. Most of those stores stay open 24-7, I think. But the library closes at 8, and if some kid refuses to leave, then I have to stay till they're gone. A few minutes past 10 is fine but clashing with teenagers till 11 until the police show up is not. Anyway, I had begun to divide the books into different categories when I suddenly heard footsteps coming from the non-fiction section. I craned my head over to peer into that direction, but a decorative pillar was in the way of my view. I sighed and got up. I would have to go investigate. The non-fiction section is on the ground level and consists of several different aisles, but it didn't take long to glance through each aisle. No one was there, so I just went back to the front desk. The moment before I sit down at my chair, though, I heard a different sound, one that honestly did creep me out a bit. That sound was whispering, 
like someone rapidly muttering under their breath, not wanting to be heard, but also not wanting to keep it to themselves. It was then that I was starting to get ghost vibes. I hadn't heard any ghost stories from my coworkers so far, so I never assumed that the library was haunted, and I wasn't really ready to assume that now. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy ghost stories, and I watched Ghost Hunters for the longest time, but it takes a lot for me to believe in something like that. I go to the nearby wall and click on the upstairs lights. Then I make my way up the flight of steps. I call out, letting anyone know who might be there that the library is closed and that they should leave. I wouldn't even need to escort them. When the doors here are locked, you can still exit from the inside. Pretty convenient. I called out twice, and still no one responded, and no one moved. Not until I make it to the top of the steps, where I suddenly hear quick footsteps traveling away from me. It sounded like they were coming from the flight of steps opposite to this one. Steadily, I made my way between the aisles up here, checking each one like I did before, slowly making my way to the other flight of steps. After seeing nothing weird or out of the ordinary up here, I use the next flight of steps to go back down to the ground floor. But on the third step from the top, I see something on the floor. I gasp audibly when I see that it's blood. A chill goes down my spine. I'm wondering if this is really happening. Wondering what this even is. A break-in? A vengeful ghost? Or nosebleed someone had earlier that day and never cleaned up? I settled on that idea. I continued down the steps making a mental note that after the books are organized, I'll need to go get that blood up. Then again, that blood did look kind of fresh, I thought. Putting it at the back of my mind, I went back to the front desk. I tried calling out a warning again. Once more, no reply. I sit down at the desk, finishing up the separating books into categories part before delivering them to their proper shelves. Social sciences, language, science, all that good stuff. After that, I returned to my desk. I double-checked the computer, where I'd just typed a list of those books that were returned. When the information looked good, I confirmed the entry. Almost the exact moment I click confirm, the whispering muttering starts again, this time coming from behind me. I was so startled and terrified that I didn't want to turn at all. But I decided to do it in a hurry. All at once, I jumped up and turned around, looking behind me, and all I see is a large, dark silhouette crossing from one aisle to the left, over to the right. It was definitely masculine. I stumble backwards, feeling for the phone at the desk. I find it and pull it up to my ear, then turn around to dial 911. An operator picked up, and I let them know that someone is in the library, possibly hurt, and they won't leave. They let me know that they'd send over someone as soon as possible. They wanted me to stay on the line, but since the desk phone was actually a corded phone, and I didn't want to be tethered to one spot, I told them I was going to hang up and wait at the front door. I had a cell phone, and if I had any further problems, I could just call them again. So I hang up the phone. I go over to the light switches on the wall again, this time turning on every light in the building. I stay at the front desk, even though I should have been making my way outside. I felt too scared to move. Why did someone sneak in here like that? Why were they muttering like a madman? And what was that blood about? All this information together made me feel like I had to be afraid of something. Just when I finally convinced myself that I should go outside, even if I had to do it slowly, I heard more whispering. This time, it was coming from above me, coming from the second floor. The second floor has balconies. That's important to know with what happened next, because suddenly, a massive weight landed on top of me. I was flattened to the floor, a wave of pain flowing throughout my body. It felt as if I'd been crushed, and then, not a moment later, a sharp and deep burning sensation erupted on my left shoulder blade. 
I kicked and I screamed. Somehow I was able to break free. I turned toward what landed on me and scurried backward. A large man stood up, trembling and shaking violently, muttering some kind of nonsense to himself under his breath constantly. Instead of staring at me, he glanced in every direction and back to me repeatedly, as if he was delusional. This man was mentally not right. Perhaps he was on drugs of some sort, but that didn't matter to me, because I was in grave danger. Pain still filing over my body, like a bunch of wasps constantly stinging me on my back. I picked myself up, and I ran for the side door. It wasn't as close as the front door, but in that direction, there wouldn't be an insane, homeless-looking man to attack me. I slammed the door open and ran outside, nearly tackling a police officer by accident. I heard him curse and glance towards my shoulder, asking me if I was okay. I told them about the man in there, that he had attacked me and that he looked crazed. Using my keys, I led them inside, where they searched the entire area. Second floor and first floor, every aisle, every point in and between. But somehow, they didn't come up with anything more than a blood spot on that step that I'd seen, and my own blood on the ground at the desk. Turns out, the man had stabbed me in the left shoulder blade with a steak knife. Thankfully, I didn't suffer much more than bruising and some stitches. I would heal up just fine, physically. Mentally, I was unstable for a while and didn't feel safe no matter if I was at home or somewhere else. That man, whoever he was, did a lot of psychological damage to me. Once the police had swept over the place, one of them came outside to stay with me. He called an ambulance. Then he tried to comfort me, letting me know what he thought of the person who attacked me. From his guess, it was probably someone on drugs. He said people around these parts take a certain kind of drug that can make them see things that aren't there. Ugh, even that made me shudder. We live in a nice town, and I wouldn't think people like that existed here. I guess I was more sheltered than I thought I was. I was given two weeks paid time off from the library to heal up and try to get back to normal. I still work there, and even now, we never heard anything more of the man, meaning... He was never caught. But for the next year or so, we did have a police officer staying there with us. He'd stay until everyone left, making sure everyone was okay. I think that might be the only reason I never quit. The Contract From Kent For the past six years, I've been self-employed, mowing lawns, doing landscaping, pulling up roots and stumps and things like that. For the first few years, I'd go door to door, knocking or leaving my business card, hoping that people wanted some lawn service. If they already had someone, maybe I could offer a better rate. I can tell you now just how competitive that sort of business is, especially in the South. You see down here, a lot of folks take pride in lawn care and farm care. When they get a tree that needs cut down, they like to do it themselves. When they've got acres of land in need of some brush hogging, they do it themselves too, more often than not. So for the first few years, my jobs were few and far between. Revenue was low, and contracts were slow to come in. I cut prices as much as I could. I'd go door to door every day, hoping that I wasn't just bothering people. Now, this story in particular is one I've wanted to tell for a while. But as I'm someone who doesn't really have people in my life, like friends or close family members, I didn't really have anyone to talk to. So it's nice to have some place to share. This is actually the story of what got my business off the ground. You see, I finally found a farmer who did not want to mow and clear his own land. He had purchased a few acres away from his own farmland, so there was a gap of forest between his new land and his current land. He wasn't too happy about this, because the bid he'd placed for the land in between was being delayed. I don't know what that means, or how bids get delayed, or how that works, but that sucks for him. But because I lived closer to the plot of land that he wanted to clear out, 
and because he was already busy with his crops on his current land, he decided to contract me to mow and clear the land there. That would entail brush hogging several acres, cutting down some trees and uprooting a bunch of stumps, all of which I know how to do and do quite well. The week came where I'd be fulfilling this contract. My plan was to get it all done within five days. Immediately upon arriving there, I noticed something weird. A good 50 yards or so of the land had been cleared already. It looked like someone started to clear it and just changed their mind. If I had to guess, it looked like the farmer did it. Maybe he stopped when he realized he didn't have time to do it himself. I just went with that and started my work. As I had two or three other clients during the day, I usually ended up out here around 6 p.m., just before it got really dark. I would work well into the morning too, usually leaving around 4 a.m. I worked myself to the bone so that I'd not only get the contract done in time, but I'd also have a spare day to make sure everything looked great. And if you're thinking that doing all this at night is a bad idea, it was well away from any other people living out there. And I'm talking miles. They wouldn't even hear me in the distance. And plus, I had a couple of spotlights that I could set up before I started working. Anyway, on to the story. The first night was the roughest. I had to figure out the most efficient angle to approach this whole lot. There were at least a dozen trees in there that needed cut down and their stumps removed. But it would be really irritating to get to that before mowing the grass, which reached over six feet in some places. It was well overgrown. So first I did a drive around of the area, slowly checking to make sure there weren't any giant rocks hidden under the grass that would tear up my brush hog. Once I'd mentally mapped a good path, I started my tractor and got to it. Now, brush hogging has always been my favorite thing to do for the business. The more to brush hog, the better. It's quite peaceful being up there, and it's especially satisfying when you turn and see a good clean cut. Anyway, I started cutting where the farmer left off to keep things neat, and because that side had fewer shrubs and trees to deal with, so I could cut more before being bothered. Now, around 7.45, when the moon was full in the sky, I nearly had a heart attack when I ran over something with the brush hog. Whatever it was let out this shrill cry that was so much louder than my tractor. I I'd never gotten goosebumps so fast. I turned off the tractor and turned around. Horrified that I may have cut up a deer, I jumped down out of my seat and went to check the blades. Everything seemed fine, and I'd pulled up a few feet before jumping down to see if there was anything under it. I didn't even find any blood. At least, I don't think I did. Because I did find a strange substance on the grass. There was this thick, syrupy, dark blue goop splotched all over the grass I had just cut. Reminded me of mucus in consistency. I stood up and looked around, peeking over the grass and checking the tree line. If I did run over something, it was apparently okay enough to walk away. I didn't see anything at first. I calmed myself down with a swig of red Gatorade. Then I climbed back into the tractor, continuing my contract. But I didn't go more than a yard, I'd say, before the tractor tipped to the left. I shut it off again and I went back to see what it was. Apparently, my back left tire had dipped into a large hole in the ground. Just as I was beginning to think that I needed to ask the farmer if he wanted this filled, I spotted more of that goop. I couldn't tell if it was leading in or out of that hole. Scratching my head, I walked back over to the tractor seat, considering myself lucky that the tractor didn't tip over completely. I must have skirted by on the edge of it, Otherwise, my tractor would have fallen in. Now, I'm searching for my keys in my coat pocket. Whenever I turned the tractor off, I had a habit of taking the keys with me, a habit I formed after some of my stuff got stolen before I started this business. But the pockets on that jacket were a bit too large and open. I cursed under my breath and hopped back out of the seat once again to go search for my keys. They couldn't have been far. They had to be on the ground somewhere in the freshly cut grass. I was knelt down, my attention focused around the back left tire. Before long, I caught a glimmer of metal just in front of the back left tire. As I reached out to grab them, I heard a sudden shuffling sound coming from my right. 
I jumped up and looked over, and I swear to God, I saw some sort of leg entering the hole. Something had just crawled into it. I slowly approached the hole again, wondering if I might be able to see what it was. I made it to the hole. I stood over it and reached out my head to peer down. It was too deep and dark to see much. I shrugged and got back on the tractor. To be honest, I was a little shaken up. I had no idea what kind of animal that was. That leg didn't appear hairy, so I was wondering to myself what kind of hairless critters were that big around these parts. That was all for the strangeness of that night. I finished up as much as I could, and when I couldn't hold my head up any longer, I called it quits and drove home. Gatorade and lukewarm coffee can only get you so far. The following day started out the same. I finished up with a couple of regular clients, then made my way to the farmer's property. I had to pass his home before getting to the acreage he wanted me to take care of, but before I made it out there, I decided to stop by his place and ask him about that hole and the already cleared portion of the land. He was taking a break on his front porch. It was about 5.15 p.m. at that point, but he had a lot more work to do. I told him I'm glad I caught him at a good time then. I told him about the hole, stating it must have been about four and a half feet wide, and Lord knows how deep. He told me he didn't know about it, but he did say he had a ton of dirt or so on his current property. He asked me to take as much as I needed to cover that hole. Sounds good, I replied. And then I asked him about the already cut part of the field. That's when his eyebrows furrowed. He quit leaning back in his rocking chair and leaned forward instead, placing his boots back on the ground. He took off his hat and scratched above his ear, then put the hat back on. Yeah, I was cutting a bit of it myself to start out with. He explained to me. But to be honest with you, besides not having the time or motivation, I just didn't feel right out there. Kept hearing things, you know? Something moving around in the grass. Something big. You can call me a crazy old fart if you like, but I just didn't like it. Would rather pay someone to do it for me and get it over with. Well, I didn't expect him to be that upfront about it, so I appreciated him letting me know. I told him I agreed with him. Something just felt scary out there. Found some weird substance on the grass, heard a weird cry, and I saw something climbing into that hole. I told him all that. He laughed and told me to be careful, and that if I had any trouble, just drive back down here and let him know. After that conversation, I headed right up to the acreage. I had a lot to do. If I planned things out right and kept working, I could clear out nearly 85% of the brush today. But first things first, I backed my truck up to the hole with the dirt piled in the back. With a shovel, I began to throw dirt in. At first, I wasn't sure if I had brought enough, but my mind was at ease as the last of the dirt went in, and the hole was perfectly filled, now level with the rest of the ground around it. I jumped down onto the dirt and started to pack it, then did the same by backing over it repeatedly with my truck tire. Perfection, I thought. Then I hopped on the tractor and started to cut. I was clearing brush for a few hours. I think it was around 9 p.m. at that point, when I heard a similar but far more terrifying and loud cry than the night before. It made me jump in my seat. I turned around and looked toward the noise, and sure enough, it was coming from the direction of that hole. I didn't feel brave enough to shut off the tractor and walk over there so I raised up the brush hog and headed over on the tractor itself. At least that way I felt a bit safer. Once I got close enough to see the hole, I swear I found several dozen marks on top of the soil that I had just packed. It looked like something had been digging in it, and I couldn't help but think that it was the same something I saw in jumping into that hole the night prior. I swallowed hard, feeling bad. Whatever it was tried to get back in the hole, back to its home, and now I'd covered it up. I took off my hat, letting the air hit the sweat on my head and cool me down. I figured it was just my job, and whatever it was could just find another hole or make a new one. I began to walk back toward the tractor. Halfway there, 
more cries rang out. This time, they were coming from the forest edge. It was shrill and rat-like, but it was far too loud to come from something as small as a rat, and whatever it was was fast, too. The cry would come from one portion of the woods, and after only four or five seconds, another cry from the same creature would ring out about 50 yards up in the tree line. I remember standing there thinking what the heck that could be. I definitely wasn't hearing things now, but due to the way the cry sounded, I told myself it was the world's largest field rat. These cries kept coming and coming for the remainder of the night. They frightened me so bad that I didn't work past 11. Instead of clearing 85% of the brush, I managed to clear up to 60, putting me well behind schedule. When I decided I was done for the day, I practically ran back to my truck. All the while, that thing out there just kept crying and crying. I started the truck and turned up the radio. A human voice would make me feel a bit more comfortable. Then I locked the doors and began to look around through the window. I kid you not, I saw something in the darkness of the tree line, maybe 60 yards away or so. Something tall and the color of early morning mist. I kicked my truck into gear and I drove away, not sure if I wanted to keep doing this contract. Then again, the farmer had been nothing but nice to me and I really, really needed the money. Plus, that farmer was well known out here and word of mouth was something else I desperately needed. Throwing my hat at the dash, I realized I had to complete this job. I had to do it quick, and I had to do it right. The day after, I bought some Bluetooth headphones at Walmart. Took me a while to set them up right. I'm not exactly knowledgeable with phones or things like that, but I figured that would help me concentrate on my work. If that thing was getting noisy again, I could just ignore it. I had some Tim McGraw and Keith Urban downloaded to my phone, so I figured I could just listen to that. By 6.25 p.m. that day, I was back at the field. I checked the hole to make sure it hadn't been dug up. It hadn't. I examined my surroundings and the tree line. Then I got on the brush hog. Finish it, I told myself. With an extra hour, I could probably cut the rest of the field, if nothing else got in the way. I put my Bluetooth headphones in my ears, picked a song, put it on shuffle, then I got rolling. And for the first four hours, it worked perfectly well. But I had drastically underestimated the battery life of the headphones. They gave me a 15% battery life remaining warning. So I took them out and put them back in their little ovular charger. The moment I pulled one from my ear, I heard it. The crying coming from within the trees. I shuddered and looked around. I couldn't see it just yet, but it was out there and it was still mad. I sighed, hoping the charger for the headphones could charge them up real fast. For the next hour, I was on edge, cutting the overgrown grass. I found myself not only scanning the trees constantly, but also looking in the grass, as if something might be lurking in there. Even a professional football player could be well hidden in that grass. I couldn't really distract myself. No matter where my mind turned, it always came back to that thing crying in the woods. A few minutes later, the cries suddenly stopped. Now, I would have guessed I'd feel better after the cries finally died down, but right away I felt about ten times worse. I was so scared and on edge at that point that I turned the tractor off and just listened. There were bugs chirping and wind blowing over the grass. The sound of grass blades brushing against each other had me a bit twitchy. With the right gust of air, it almost sounded like something moving past the grass. Once I had thoroughly convinced myself I was just paranoid, I started up the tractor again and kept moving. One thought that really helped me was the idea that the tractor and brush hog were so loud that surely it would scare away anything that could be out there. But at that point, I gotta be honest. I found myself missing the cries, because then at least I knew where that creature was, even if I didn't know what it was exactly. Then suddenly, my tractor stalled. I couldn't get it to start. I was mad, 
I had a lot to do and I couldn't really afford to fix it, not without dipping into my savings, which were already low. Deep down, though, I saw this as an out. I could finish up clearing the brush in a couple of hours once I got it fixed the next day. Heck, I would even come by early, just to have a bit more daytime to fix the tractor and get the brush cleared. I had this idea in my head that once all the brush was cleared and things were more visible, I wouldn't be as scared. Unfortunately, that night, the way the tractor was angled, I'd either have to walk along the tree line or cut through the tall grass to make it back to my truck. Neither of these scenarios sounded good to me. So I just cut through the grass. A straight line would be much quicker of a walk. But not being able to see more than a few inches in front of me made me a bit more paranoid than I already was. I could have sworn I kept hearing something else moving through the grass as well. Just keep walking straight, I reminded myself. Just a few more yards and... Suddenly, I tripped over something. I almost fell on my face, but my hands reached out just in time to keep that from happening. Still, I cut my palms pretty bad. As I began to pick myself back up, I still felt the sensation of something at my leg. I hadn't just tripped over something. I'd been grabbed, and whatever it was, was still grabbing onto me. I looked toward my leg as the pressure built up further, causing an intense stinging pain at my ankle. When I looked towards my foot, I saw it, and I nearly screamed. A veiny, tan, four-fingered hand, ending in dark black nails, clung tight to my ankle. The moment that I wanted to scream, I instead instinctively pulled my leg away, and at the same time, whatever was holding on to me yanked. Luckily for me, this happened to cause the hand to slide a bit until it was over my shoe, which then came off and I was freed. I picked myself up and ran like a madman through the grass. I soon broke through to the cleared portion of the field, but I must have been turned around because I was by the tree line now. I looked over to my right and the truck was there, now closer. It was only a 20-yard run between me and safety but the tall part of the grass would still be nearby, even next to my truck, thanks to the pattern I was mowing in. I took off at a full sprint, limping awkwardly thanks to my missing shoe and injured ankle. What came next didn't surprise me. I basically expected it, but it still horrified me. The sound of something bounding through the tall grass next to me, alongside me as I ran, I could tell just how much faster it was than me, and I couldn't help but wonder why it never lapped out and dragged me away. It could if it wanted to, but I made it to my truck. I flung open the door, slammed it shut, turned the key in the ignition, and drove home. There I sat in the dark interior of my truck, my ankle severely bruised, even further behind on my contract that I had to finish or I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. A grown man, nearly at tears. What was wrong with me? I brainstormed the entire drive home, praying that there weren't any cops at the regular speed traps, because I wasn't driving right at all. Not in that panicked state. But my racing mind finally led me to an idea. My brother. My brother lived a couple of towns over, about an hour away so it wasn't too close, but I was desperate, more than ever. I gave him a call that night. I apologized because he had been sleeping. Then I asked him if he'd join me on a job. I offered him half of the pay of the contract to help me finish it out, but I never told him the other half of his duty, to just be there and make me feel safe. You see, my brother had a sidearm and a concealed carry permit so I would certainly feel safer with him being there. With double the manpower, I was able to finish up the grass the next day and clear out nearly all the stumps. I had to sacrifice half my pay, but I really did appreciate my brother coming by. Now, toward the end of that day, we had the choice of staying overtime to just finish it up and call it quits for good, or come back the next day for a half day. In my head, doing a half day the next day meant a little bit more daytime to finish up, 
But then again, the idea of just getting it done that night felt better. So that's what we decided to do. We worked until about 5 a.m., and the worst that happened then was my brother coming to me when I had my headphones in and asking me what those weird sounds are. And yeah, it was the same sounds, the shrill cries that were rat-like. And now I know they weren't from a rat. I told him it was just a bird. He went back to work, not really interested to know what kind of bird it was. When we were finally done, we went over to Waffle House and celebrated. But my stomach was queasy. The idea that I had put my brother in danger too, just because I wanted to feel better, and I never told him about what was out there, made me feel a bit guilty. But maybe I'll share this story with him soon. I hope he takes it well. And I hope that farmer's out there and he's doing okay. Last I heard from him, that hole that I had packed got dug into and is open for business once again. Attack at Midnight From Patrick I was in Littleton, Colorado, spring 2017. I worked at the Melting Pot Restaurant, which currently occupies an old three-story building that was built in the early 1900s as a Carnegie Library. There have been many documented cases of paranormal behavior at this location, and the restaurant was even featured on a ghost hunting TV show. The most haunted area is located in the basement in a little L-shaped cove that has five booth tables for dining. The cove was down two little stairs, and immediately when entering, you had a four-top table on your left and a two-person table on your right. Past the four-top in the corner was a large round booth, and around the bend was two more four-top tables and a dead end. The last table in the cove was considered the most haunted table in the restaurant. Many times, people would bring spirit contacting boards and different conjuring-type things to try and evoke a spirit and sit in the last table to do just that. One day, a co-worker and I were cleaning these tables late one night, and he goes, Ow, dang, did you just scratch me? I hadn't touched him, and I told him that. He lifts up his shirt, and there are three large bleeding scratches going all the way down his back. He immediately freaks out, and soon after, he quit, feeling as if this entity was trying to follow him home. A year later, I hadn't seen anything else unusual. One night, around midnight, I started antagonizing the spirit in this area. Even after seeing that kid get scratched, I still wasn't convinced. So I was down there, yelling out for something, saying something like, You don't exist. If you did, you would show yourself. I figured there wouldn't be an answer, so I went back to bussing my last tables for the night. I was carrying a bus tub down the back stairs and had to walk by this cove to get to the kitchen. I've been a server for years and never drop anything, let alone drop something out of a bus tub. Well, I go walking by the cove, and a metal fondue pot goes flying out of my bus tub down the two stairs and into the haunted cove. I continued to the kitchen to place down my bus tub. I then grabbed a towel to clean up the chocolate mess I'd made. At that point, I had forgotten about the antagonizing I had done an hour earlier. So I go charging into the L-shaped cove to clean up the chocolate fondue pot that had somehow just leapt out of my bus tub and down the stairs. As soon as I enter, something grabs me by my right shirt sleeve, throwing me into the rock wall, immediately smashing my head into it. It leaves me with a goose egg bump and a large cut on my forehead. I was so startled, and I was bleeding everywhere at that point. I had to run to the bathroom to assess the situation. Sure enough, I found a three-inch gash and a large lump. That's when I recalled what I had done earlier and realized it may have been a bad idea. I go upstairs and my coworkers say, Whoa, what happened to you? Look like you saw a ghost. Telling me I was as white as could be and I looked scared. I tell them I think I was just attacked by a ghost. 
I honestly can't explain the pot flying out of my bus tub like that, and then an unseen force just slamming me into the wall. Well, the only explanation I can come up with is that the spirit caused me harm. So my warning to you would be, don't antagonize haunted places and the spirits there, unless you're ready for the repercussions. Working solo can be spooky. From Sean D. You wouldn't think that a sock factory would be a spooky place to work by yourself. The steam presses hiss, the thumps, the clinks, all these things can have an almost hypnotic rhythm. The rule of thumb there is that no one is allowed to work if they are the only ones that have shown up. This happens more than you think when you work the second shift, and there are only three people counting yourself on the crew. I didn't really know of the no-show rule until I'd already worked a solo shift myself, and after that one night, I had a sneaking suspicion why. I had been clocked in for nearly half an hour when my cell phone rang. The supervisor was on the other end. I won't be in, so when the other two get in, just board the socks. Which is what the process of steam pressing them is called. Do that for four hours, then after break, you're on bagging, and the other two will work repair. Well, neither work partner came in, and due to the Rona, if anyone was feeling the tiniest bit ill, they weren't supposed to come in. They would have to take a sick day. Boarding solo wasn't permitted due to safety concerns, so I set up the bagging station. Now, bagging is a very easy job. It often causes me to lose track of time. I only noticed it was time for my break when I had a sudden and intense feeling I was being watched. I looked around and I spotted someone in the boiler cage. They were watching me. I couldn't get a clear look at their face, and oddly enough, despite the heat of the boiler, they were wearing a black hooded sweater. Add to that the mandatory face mask, the mystery watcher had almost total facial concealment. When I looked directly at them, they immediately pretended to be busy, checking the boiler. I kept a watchful eye on them on my way to the break room, I knew it could not have been an intruder, as employees need an access card just to get in the factory. After my break, I decided to check the boiler cage. Maybe I did just see one of the employees, perhaps a new employee. I could at least introduce myself to them. I was almost out of work orders to bag up, and I'd have free time to help them with anything they may need. When I reached the boiler, they were gone so I just went back to work. Just like before, I would lose track of time and suddenly get an overwhelming feeling of being watched. When I looked over at the boiler cage, they were standing inside it, just staring at me. This time I reacted immediately, smiling as I approached them while saying hello. They exited the cage as I made my way over so I went around some shelves hoping to meet them as they closed the gate behind them. When I made it to the gate, they were nowhere in sight. Not only that, but the gate was closed and padlocked. I was obviously confused. I didn't hear the gate open or close, and I definitely would have heard the padlock snapping shut. I looked around for the mystery person, but I didn't see them anywhere nearby. I finished my job that night, albeit a bit distracted from my constant glances at the boiler. As I left, I could feel someone watching me through a window. I didn't bother looking back. Instead, I just quickened my step. I don't think that I saw a spirit. I believe that I saw a living, breathing person. At least, that's exactly what it looked like. The factory isn't really that old, not old enough to be haunted, best to my knowledge. Besides, a ghost wouldn't need a face mask, would they? The house I work at is kinda creepy. From Wayward Companion. I work at a group home for autistic adults. 
Our house has five residents, and I work the third shift. The house itself is actually quite nice. A two-story, six-bedroom home in an affluent neighborhood. Honestly, it's a beautiful home. It's not even that old, built sometime in the late 80s or early 90s. But it is definitely haunted. Co-workers told me as much when I first started working there, almost two years ago. In fact, one of my co-workers was so freaked out by something that happened to her that she refused to go upstairs for any reason. Now, I work the third shift alone, which is nerve-wracking enough. I'm a girl on the shorter side and in charge of caring for five adult men, some of whom have occasional violent outbursts. It's not uncommon to get physically attacked or to have to deal with someone engaging in destructive or self-injurious behavior. That kind of stuff is just part of the job. Now add to that the weird, creepy things that happen, and you've got a terrifying combination. One of our guys sometimes gets up in the middle of the night. Typically, we would have to go see what they need. Usually, it's just a trip to the bathroom or a drink of water. Except for when one of our guys is up. Let's call him JJ. When JJ's up, it's sometimes a bit more, shall I say, unsettling. You see, we often find JJ standing in front of his open closet, and he'll be uh, talking to it. The thing is, one night I saw something in the closet, an entity or shadow person. I could have gone on thinking it was just one of his eccentricities, had I not seen the blacker-than-black humanoid shape with glowing red eyes standing in his closet one night after I'd heard him get up and I went upstairs to put him back to bed. I'd like to say I was brave and went in to save him from whatever it was in his closet, but in all honesty, I just stood there in shocked horror for a few moments while my brain tried to process what I was seeing. Then I noped it back down the stairs for the night. Then there are those doors which are alarmed and we keep locked because a few of our guys are runners who would wander off if they got outside unattended. Despite that, at least once a week, the garage door or the door to the patio just swings open by itself. Then there's the most recent event that happened only a few hours ago. Tonight, while sitting in the living room doing paperwork, I heard an almighty crash coming from the kitchen. I jumped up thinking one of the guys was up and had snuck into the kitchen. But when I went to check, no one was in there, and nothing was out of place. More disturbingly, after a quick check, I was completely freaked out by the fact that all the guys were soundly sleeping. The sound I'd heard had been extremely loud, so much so that the wall behind me shook. Not to mention all our guys are light sleepers. The lightest sleeper's bedroom is just off the kitchen, and yet he just slept through it soundly when he should have been wide awake. I have no explanation for what I'd heard. In fact, as I'm writing this, I feel a presence like someone is watching me, and I've got six hours to go before my shift ends. It wasn't human. This is more of a going to work in the early morning slash late night kind of story. From Jason M., this took place during the winter of 2017. I work at a gas station in a small town in Northern California. I've got the opening shift at my work, which is 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now, I'd recently totaled my car after hydroplaning into a ditch, so I was left without a vehicle to drive to and from work until I got the insurance money to get a new one. Since my job is only about a mile and a half from my apartment, I decided it'd be good for me to get some exercise for the time being. So I started to walk to work in the mornings. The road was paved and fairly well trafficked, but in the pitch black darkness of 4.30 a.m. when I had to begin my commute, it was rare to see anyone driving down the road at all. So one especially cold morning, I began my walk to work along the road, as I usually did. 
About half a mile in, I always passed by a forested area next to the road. This part had no street lights or anything, so I used my powerful flood flashlight to light my way. As anyone might do in the dark, I was continuously using it to peer into my shadowed surroundings as I walked. Half a mile down the road, I began to hear something rustling in the bushes off to the side of the road up ahead of me. I began to feel as if I was being watched. I stopped and shone my light on the bush in question and just about jumped out of my skin when it emerged from the bushes. It was just a deer. As it crossed the street and hopped into the shrubs on the other side, I told myself to not be so jumpy and that nothing around here could really be a danger to me. If only I knew how wrong I was. About another half mile down the road, the feeling of being watched returned, but this time the hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up. As I tried to convince myself that it was just another deer, my light passed over some bushes a little ways into the tree line to my left, about 50 feet behind me. Keep in mind the next few events I'm going to describe all happened within a few split seconds. My light suddenly shone upon what seemed to be a crouching figure with its back to me, facing a bush. At first, I thought it was a homeless man, but as I stopped walking and I shined my light directly at the crouching figure, I very clearly saw that, to my absolute horror, it wasn't human at all. Whatever it was, it appeared to be naked. It had no hair on its body, and its skin was very pale. Its limbs were unnaturally long and spindly. The thing looked like, if it stood up, it might be more than eight feet tall. Its fingers were very long and thin, too, and ended in sharp black points like claws. The second I shined my light over it, it quickly turned its head to look at me. Its eyes, they glowed like an animal's eyes do in the dark, like a cat's eyes or a deer's. I didn't get a great look at its face, but whatever it was, I knew it wasn't human. But it certainly wasn't an animal either, not a normal one. The moment it looked at me, I bolted down the road, and I didn't look back. Over my panicked gasping, I thought I heard it chasing me, which made me desperately push myself to go faster. Suddenly in the distance ahead of me on the road, a car's headlights appeared, and as I kept sprinting, the car soon passed me, going behind me and out of sight. I no longer heard that thing behind me, but I kept running anyway, and I didn't stop until I made it to work. Huffing and gasping for air, I arrived at work, and I told my coworker what had just happened. He didn't look so much surprised as he did concerned, and told me another coworker of mine had seen the same creature recently. He had described it to him exactly as I had, every last detail. Needless to say, I'm never going to walk to work in the dark again. I'll just call an Uber or something from now on. Whispers in the Dark From Patrol Officer I'm a security officer for a company in Southern California. We actually work alongside the sheriff's department in the cities that we service. As a patrol officer, my job in this specific company is essentially the same as that of a police officer. Unlike your typical observe and report security guards, we respond to calls ranging from simple trespassers to burglary, domestic abuse, kidnapping, and shots fired. Hence the officer in the title. I've been in a couple of foot and vehicle pursuits. That's just the way we operate which is why we've worked alongside the local sheriff's offices. Now that you all know what we do, let me get to the story. I used to work the late beat before being switched to days. When this story happened, I was working from 2200 to 0600 in the morning. I remember driving around the city in my patrol vehicle, 
listening to our two-way radio for any calls when I got one in my district. A burglary alarm on the north side of the city, out in the desert, and had to be around one in the morning when I was sent to check it out. As soon as I pull into the street leading to the property, I rolled in dark, which just means I shut off all the lights. The building used to be an onion packaging factory, with hangars on the west side of the property, but now it was abandoned, and we were contracted to watch it. I've been in there alone many times when I checked it twice a night, but never had an experience up until this night. Keep in mind that the property does not have working lights at all. Anyway, I pull onto the west side of the property, visually inspecting the exterior perimeter when I observed a slightly open door. I key up on my radio. Lincoln 1 to control. Dispatch, go ahead. This is Lincoln 1. Be advised I have an open door on the west side of the hangars. Can you roll an additional unit to my location? I stand by my vehicle, smoking a cigarette under the drizzle that is rare for Southern California. I like the rain, though. The wind was also blowing pretty hard this night, from what I remember. Anyway, about five minutes later, my partner arrives, who also happens to be my really good friend outside of work. We pull our guns and flashlights and go inside. The first thing you always noticed when entering is the stench of onion. I mean, it was so pungent that you could taste it through your nose. The hangars we were clearing are huge, dark, empty, and filled with that rotten smell. This is where things get creepy. We can hear the light drizzle hit the sheet metal, the wind blowing through whatever cracks they find, and it happens. We heard footsteps on the roof of the hangars. I look at my partner and say, what the heck? These hangars don't have access to the roof. How did they get up there? He replies, I don't know. Call it in. Lincoln 1 to control. Be advised we hear footsteps on the roof. We are code 6, 1023 until further. Which pretty much means we're out on investigation. Stand by until further notice. Dispatch acknowledges and we walk through the building, checking all corners until we get outside. We check the perimeter of the building and just like I thought, no access to the roof. Plus, it's raining. Who the heck would be up there? Anyway, we put it off on the wind. We check everything possible and call it code 4, or all good. As we're walking back through the hangars we just cleared, since it's the only way to exit to get back to our vehicles, the creepiest thing happens. Now, I've never been a believer in the paranormal, and I always rolled my eyes when I would watch ghost shows on TV, and they would say they would hear whispering, but could never make it out. Well, I kid you not, my partner and I heard whispering as if multiple voices were doing it simultaneously, and even though we heard it clear as freaking day, I couldn't make it out. My partner and I freeze in our tracks and just stare at each other. We pull our guns again, flashlights shining all over the walls. I call in a code six again, and we start to clear the property once more. We knew what we heard was not normal, but we had to treat it as someone possibly being in here that we missed. This is when all heck breaks loose. Doors begin slamming everywhere, footsteps on the roof and whispering can all be heard, and then, all of a sudden, it stops. My partner and I just stare at each other, and without saying a word, we just walk outside with our guns in hand. I can't say we were scared, but we were definitely shocked and amazed. I call in a secondary code four. I stand outside with my partner and look at him. I say, we'll just blame it on the wind. He looks at me and nods. And that was the last night I ever went to that place before my promotion to corporal and I switched to day shifts. I still don't believe in many ghost stories that are shared, but you can rest assured that even I don't believe it was the wind that night. There's no way in hell.